Hello, <coughs> everybody, or viewers of YouTube, whatever, people, people watching this video, hello. <laughs> My name is Aiden, and this is uh, Aiden's Read Stuff channel, and welcome to my second visual novel reading of Fall Milestone 1. Blind, blind. I mean the second one of the channel. <laughs> I do have an introduction video which I just recorded before this. If you want to know the proper schedule of how things are in this channel, it will be... You just click on the channel and it should be the first video you see. Um, so I'm going to take five minutes. I think I'll do this for every visual novel series just to explain stuff. Um, maybe about the channel and about what I know of the visual novel um, and stuff. So for quick introduction, like I said, the channel. This channel is um, a visual novel reading channel where I will read and react to the visual novel and comment on it. Not like an audiobook. I know some people like uh, like just to read it, but this is a more interactive on me and giving my open thoughts about the novels. Um, this will be uh, in the secondary novel slot. So on my channel, there will be two visual novels running at once with the main slot being uploaded three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Well, the secondary slot will be two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you should, well, expect to see this every Tuesday, Thursday at 12 p.m. EST, Toronto time. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but even as a secondary novel, obviously, I will give my best to um, read it and give proper thoughts on it. Um, currently I'm reading Seiya no Yuta as my primary novel, which is a horror slash ero... I still don't know how to say it, ero... Roach? Roddy? Which means it has some sexual scenes. It's a really good novel, though. Um, my, my recordings are pretty stuffed of it, just because I haven't, um... I haven't, because it was my first videos, so, like, the first two episodes, the volume was too loud for the, so you could barely hear my voice, and then for a while, I was using my microphone on my headset, which gave off, uh, it was a little too compressed, so my words would cut out. Right now, I'm using a webcam mic, which, you know, might not be the best quality, but at least you can properly, clearly hear me, which I think is what... You would want for a visual novel. Also, that is a train. I am not so train, so you might hear that periodically through the recording. <laughs> but yeah, okay. What do I know about Fault Milestone 1? Absolutely nothing aside from the synopsis which I read before buying it. Um, the reasons that I am playing this, one, for my main visual novels, like the list I have that I want to read are all like super dark and um, gloomy, deter like disturbing and stuff like that. So I feel like if I'm doing a secondary one, I should have something a lot more lighter. Like if I'm just reading dark stuff the whole time, I'm just gonna become a pretty depressing person, right? And you know, this one seems, I mean, just looking at this title screen, I'm sure there's gonna be some like depressing moments. There usually is in fantasy drama stuff, but overall, I think it's gonna be more cozy and enjoyable. Um, but I don't, I don't actually know too much about this game. I know that it is relatively new, like I think 2014, 15 when it came out. 2016 when it was English released. It's the um, developer's only project. They have like, they have a sequel and I think the prequel is being released in English. So, which makes me pretty happy. You know, I always like to see 
smaller developers. I don't, I, I'm guessing they're smaller because this is their only project. Well, maybe not small, at least new developers do well. And obviously, this was probably good enough if it's getting, you know, sequel, sequels and prequels. I think there's a... I think it's like part two of Milestone 2 is coming out next year. So yeah, it's getting a lot of traction, so might as well check it out. Another reason is, um, as explained in my introductory, introductory video, I actually, I don't have a lot of experience in visual novels, and um, I've never read like a, a fantasy visual novel where the world is actually like completely like made up. Like that's technically like, I read Fate, which is kind of like a modern fantasy, like Harry Potter kind of thing. But I've never actually read something with a, just a fantastical world. So I think that's pretty interesting. I heard this is also a bit of sci-fi, so sci-fi fantasy. But yeah, I've never read something like this, so I'm interested. Um, also, another reason why it was on sale for like. 70% off. It was only $5. So uh, getting a visual novel for $5, pretty cheap considering a lot of the ones I am interested reading for my, um, my main, the prime, primary visual novel are all like $30. <laughs> so it's cheap and I don't think we would have many, uh, like, I don't, I don't think I'll regret it for $5, right? I kind of have, like, I don't really have an expectation for it. Because I don't know anything about it. So, I just said I'm completely neutral on it. Which is pretty good. Also, I hear my dog whining. Give me literally 30 seconds and I will fix it. All right, <laughs> hopefully no more interruptions. As per usual, I'm unlucky. Uh, I think I've done everything. Yeah, I don't know the keyboard controls, but I'm assuming it's, hopefully it's said Santa Utah's. There was a prologue, which you missed, because I had to set up everything, so we will read that quickly. Or just read it, I guess. Doesn't have to be quickly. Does it hurt a lot? Asked the boy, his eyes clouded with concern. No. The girl answered softly, her gaze shifting from the night sky above the boy cradled in her arms. Ha <laughs> ha, you're a terrible liar, retorted the boy, his eyes focused on the bloodstained cloth wrapped tightly around her left arm. Pain was the only obvious feeling he knew she was experiencing. The binding originally stained ruby red with the girl's blood had discolored into an intense piercing shade of black. Without proper treatment, the girl would die from massive blood loss. You always came here to watch the stars, right? Asked the boy, relieved to have a moment to converse with the girl. Maybe she'll share a secret or two, the boy hoped. With that vain hope in mind, the boy asked another question. Do... Do you think you could tell me what you think about when you look at those stars? The boy asked in anticipation, like a child longing to hear his mother tell him a bedtime story. I wasn't looking at the stars, she answered. The girl was no older than the boy himself, yet her words carried such weight unheard of from one so young. Upon hearing these words, the boy felt an emotion unknown to him begin to take root within his heart. 
Is it attachment to this girl? Could it be envy? Or was this emotion perhaps a delusion as he lay dying in her arms? The boy had no longer had the time to affirm his own predicament. Then what are you looking up there for? Asked the boy, forcing himself to speak through the excruciating pain he experienced. A possibility. A possibility? Repeated the boy. A possibility for all of us to realize how power powerless we really are. What I look for among those stars is a possibility for compassion, uttered the girl, as large tears began to swell and drop from her eyes. As her reign of sorrow continued, she caressed the boy as a mother with her own child, and prayed aloud, This world doesn't end at the borders of this country. What lies beyond are countless possibilities that none of us may fully fathom. The girl continued to speak as a boy near death's door with every breath he took. People need to encounter something much bigger than themselves to fully understand. True compassion. This world will understand someday. Uh, I'm already sad. <laughs> God damn. Okay, let's just start this off then. Then, putting me in a, in a blue mood. You're supposed to cheer me up, game. In a time of yore, humankind had discovered mana, a naturally occurring energy source that long pulsed throughout the crust of the world. Humankind utilized mana from the land to craft and create any and all. The art of manifesting mana was known as mana craft and practitioners of this art became known as mana craft mana crafters okay mana craft and mana crafters hmm. a hunter could use pyrocraft to kill and cook their catch a quarry an apothecary could use aqua craft to increase the potency of their healing potions a carpenter could use terra craft to strengthen the foundation of a home. A farmer could use arrow craft to improve crop output by manipulating <laughs> excuse me by manipulating the wind so just explaining us the system of mana which seems to be elemental based I guess fire, water, earth air. There also existed mana craft which were hereditary, unique to only certain of it individuals. Kind, you know, I'm just trying to make the relation to the Fate series since I don't have too much to go on, but you know how the Fate series had people either had an elemental magic type or they had a unique one, like Emiya was to swords. I guess this would be like I mean, it's kind of similar, right? We, I just don't know. I need examples of the unique ones to do that. But yeah, so there's unique ones and there's elementals. The Path Down. The Path Down uses mana as medium to transfer the memories and experiences of the present ruler to the future heir of the throne. Ooh. Humankind would deem those Possession of hereditary mana crate. Ma it's mana craft. It's the spelling throws me off. To be monarchs. So it's a lot more rare to have the unique one. Okay. Oh, wait, no. Wait, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think that's what they meant. Unless they just mean the path down. The propagation of the old king's wisdom through path down was evident enough to cement a country's reputation as a formidable manacraft monarchy. 
I think that just means unique ones in general. Centuries ago, hell bent on expanding their sphere of influence, the Manicraft monarchies started the period of exploration. Even the great seas were no match for their ambitions. The research of Manicraft for large scale warfare exploded, fueled by the need for conquest. The populace's survival drove one monarchy to expansion. Stagnant economy, the reason for another. Ambitions drew many others. For the few Manicraft monarchies that successfully survived, a countless number of lives were sacrificed to maintain power. In the present day, the development of mana facilitated communication revolutionized an already altered world. The world. This form of communication was known as Comcraft. Like telephones, but they use mana as energy, I guess. People were no longer restricted by the pace of couriers to carry written messages. Long distance communication became accessible to the masses. Education and knowledge became abundant. Secularism grew in popularity among the general public. Enlightenment was abundant in this new era ushered forth by the Tom Craft. Okay. Okay, dude. Rusenhide. Rusenhide. Renowned pacif pacifist kingdom of sunny Azure Azure's Azure's Die? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Forgive me for mispronouncing these odd names. I mean, I guess most fantastical stories have weird city names. Further prevailed from Comcraft's convenience. For nine generations, Rusenhide prospered from perpetual passes pacifism, but even the wisdom of the old kings could not prevent tragedy from befalling this kingdom of peace and order. Tragedy which would ultimately end peace that was established over 60 years ago. Okay, a lot of uh, ex exposures, exposition? That was blood, I think. Obviously. We need these for fantasy stories. Phil, I'm not reading that. I think that's Rusenhide, though. <laughs> Chapter 1, Galvanize. So basically, we have a world. Wait, let me check how... Uh, now the audio should be fine, I think. We have a world that... That uses magic, and I guess this calm craft is kind of. It reminds me of like phones and Wi Fi, so I guess that's the sci fi part of it. So th those are probably contrasting, and I guess we're in a pretty peaceful country. Ruled by. Honestly, the path down stuff sounds really cool. Maintaining, actual maintaining the knowledge of the past uh, teams. Alright, let's get right into this. Rusen High Castle, passageway to Sky Terrace. Sparks continued to dance through the air as a small silhouette ascended the spiral staircase. Girl. First, to the Sky Terrace. Okay, I guess this isn't voice acted, so I'm gonna have to, uh... I, I, I have no voice acting, uh... Uh, skills, but... Uh, I'll try. I thought I didn't know. I didn't. Whatever. Let's just do it. First, to the Sky Terrace! The first of the attackers to reach the Sky Terrace on the roof of the castle was a young girl, no more than 12 or 13 years of age. She quickly stands her surrounding and gets in a defensive pose. Holding her breath, she surveys the area for a while. According to her prior intelligence, the Sky Terrace was completely deserted, except for one. Path down successor of the country of Rusenheide, self 
find roots and hide. Show yourself. You know there's nowhere for you to hide now. The girl's shout reverberated throughout the empty terrace. There was no one around, but she maintained her guard. Those were the actions of someone who's done it a countless number of times. She moved towards the center of the sky terrace with a mechanical efficiency which betrayed her small and delicate appearance. So, as we can see, I guess they're being invaded. This girl's probably like her commander, I don't know, she looks pretty important. Is there really no one here? Maybe the intel was wrong. Cyan, can you hear me? Cyan, if you can hear me, respond. I guess that's the calm, calm craft <laughs> with the hand over the ear like a phone. Tsh! Is she in the middle of a fight? No one's here. The girl lets her guard down and takes a deep long breath. Hmm? Further in the terrace was a balcony that also functioned as a viewing deck of sorts. It was designed to overlook the town around the castle, and there's a large wooden dining table was situated in the middle of it. The table was furnished with an ornately woven tablecloth. It was surrounded with heavy, solid wooden chairs, and atop it were numerous intricately made ornaments. The table and all its amenities were works of art. Every object from the dining table to the decoration strategically placed throughout the sky terrace screamed of wealth. Something crosses the girl's mind as she sets the chair at the head of the table upright and sits in and sits her small frame onto it. She looks pretty adorable. <laughs> Look how small she looks in the chair. <laughs> For a moment she's taken aback by it all. It was truly the height of luxury. The view she had from the head of the table, have, having grown in, up in meager circumstances, was impressive beyond her imagination. Hee <laughs> hee. Slam. In a display of terrible manners, she rests both of her, both her feet on the table and reclines against the chair, slowly closing her eyes. Aha. She couldn't help but to laugh at the disparity between the situation and the place where she had grown up. Whose seat was this? Under what lucky star would you have would you have to be born under to be granted the privilege to seat yourself on a chair like this? Well, not that it mattered. The chair was now no one's. Just like how this crumbling castle was to be no one's as well. I'm sure it'd feel wonderful if I could have a meal on a table like this. From the balcony created to look upon the town below, the girl gazes at the townscape set ablaze. The perfect view. Just perfect. Ha. Huh. This is just stupid. After her rather mindlessly soliloquy, way, she gets up off her seat then. Ah. Girl too. Another girl appeared from the door that she had broken through just earlier. Miss Mary Shell. The girl addressed as Mary Shell waved her hand in a yo pose as she was joking. Mary. <coughs> oh, I thought. Okay, that's her name. That that was not. Okay, Coco, you like the chair? Sitting. The same girl posed a question to her partner in a rather broken speech. No, I... not really. As always, she doesn't have a shred of tension in her. So Coco thought, keeping it to herself. Mary... Sh Mary's... Mary Shell? In terms of age, she and Coco were not far apart. In contrast to Coco's rather belligerent look, she looked to be a sweet little girl who had no place in a miserable battlefield like this. However, a great many have been deceived by their innocent looks. Their blood that now stained her dress certainly stood out. I'm surprised you can just waltz around like that with all this going on. Hmm? An imaginary question mark appears atop Mary, Mary Shell's 
Count Mary show. <laughs> she didn't understand why Coco was so astonished. No reason to rush. Of course you'd rush. Just walking around with all this going on is weird. The castle was filled with the smell of blood and smoke. Screams and explosions continued to roar throughout. Despite the... I don't know that word. Cacophony going off all around them. Mary Shell simply stood there, oblivious to it all. Already. Almost done. No point. Running. Well, that's true, but... Coco was at a loss for words when faced with that simple retort. She... not here? Uh, no, she's not. Uh, can we even rely on Scion's info? Scion. Reliable. Even if wrong, we follow. Sister's borders. You mean orders. Orders. <laughs> Unflinching. Rather than communicating with words, she st struck the same hand waving pose from earlier. That was one of Mary Shell's ways of expressing herself. Still, if they aren't here, where could they be? I'm pretty sure we've searched everywhere. Plan B. A manual search? Ugh, what a pain. The sheer size of this place makes my head spin. He he. Funny face. Oh, leave me alone. Fine, plan B then. Let's stick to the plan and take one wing each. I'll be on the east wing. What's wrong? We look. Yes. Won't dispel shadow soldiers? I'll be fine. There's only 150 of them. We've already taken most of the rear line soldiers, so I doubt we'll run into anyone troublesome. Uh, what is it? Overconfident. Confidence. Your weakness. Your voice was soft, but her words carried weight. Everything. Going too well. Won't forget that. I, I won't. Coco unconsciously stands at attention. Nothing wrong. In Ian careful. That's all. Th that was scary. She suddenly flips into serious mode and all. Other people probably wouldn't understand the sudden change in Mary Shell's attitude. Putting thoughts and emotions into words is a weak point of hers. Logical, seeing that she only recently began remembering her vocabulary. However, even though her vocabulary is lacking, she is in no way unintelligent or unable to grasp the situation at hand. Coco, being her partner, understood this very well. Hello? Hello? Coco, can you hear me? Hmm? Ah, Scion. Yeah, I hear you. How's it going there? You done fighting? The third floor downwards has been has all been committed. It's not as people don't suddenly start raining down from the sky. No one else should be able to get into the castle. Wanna oh, and get a load of this. Really, the last two guys I just killed, they were such pushovers. It kind of ruined the moment. Like I'd get more of a thrill from dreaming in an afternoon nap. Coming from someone who personally said she'd just keep guard? Can't really complain if you didn't volunteer head to head up to the front lines instead. So, how are things going on your end? Ignoring me, eh? Alright, oh, this place is totally empty. You've got some explaining to do here. You sure the princess is in the sky terrace? Absolutely! If she isn't around the balcony, then she's got to be somewhere on the top floor. Look harder, why don't you? Ugh. Looking around is a huge pain. It's so tiring. You sure are lazy for someone so young. I don't want to hear that from someone who volunteered to shore up our defenses. Oh, quit complaining and just get looking. We've already... We're already on home stretch. Get off my back. Really, though. This whole thing... Sure was a breeze, eh? Rusenhide, Rusenhide, the center of the alliance, and all is supposed to fall this quickly, this easily? Well, Miss Milano planned it out this much, and she's even taken part in it too. 
Well, let's be honest here. It's probably mostly because of the ladder than anything else. What? What? You mean we all could have gotten this far without the help of the Shadow Soldiers? No, that's not what I mean. Considering Miss Milano, I bet she could probably take down an entire country or two. If I had to describe her with a single word, it'd be cheater. Y you've got a point. Anyway, I'll get back to com committing the entire castle's interior. Good luck with the search. Yeah, see you. Between Miss Mar Mary Shell and Zion, why isn't there anyone who's feeling any more tense than I am? And now I've totally lost my drive too. Damn it. Just as she finished her call. Huh? What? Huh? Coco's staff was made from a metal alloy. It was made to prioritize lightness, but metal is still metal. A string from any old sword would certainly nick it, but there was no way it would slice through it so cleanly. What was that? There's something stuck to the wall. A, a transparent knife? A blade of ice? Or perhaps some kind of illusion using craft? In any case, it doesn't change the fact that there is some kind of unknown threat. Who goes there? Show yourself. Out from the darkness emerged yet another girl. One of their retainers, perhaps. She was wearing a formal-looking outfit, with her entire body wrapped in a purple cloak. However, what first caught Coco's attention was the badge shining brightly on her co collar. The badge served as proof as the individual's rank as a crafter. D Duel? The title of Dual Crafter is only granted to those who have mastered two of the four types of mana, Pyro, Aqua, Terra, and Arrow. But the girl standing before Coco could not have been more than 20 years of age. She was likely in her late teens. To become a tool crafter at 18, 19 years of age was quite a remarkable feat. Ritona Rainvasta. She is the last descendant of Rainvasta family, which has served at the royal family's guardians for generations upon generation. But Coco had no way of knowing that. Where do you come from? What is your objective? Why are you going after Princess Selphine? Huh? Ah ha ha ha. Let's just get one thing straight here. This attack of ours is completely in our control. Whether you all live or die, that's up to us to decide. <laughs> do you understand? The only thing you can do is stare back at us and answer every question we've got. Oh, well, if you want to die, then that's another story. Very well. All right, seeing as how you, how you dress, that means you're one of the servants here, right? You happen to know where Selfine is? And what if I do? Serious? All right, I'll cut you a deal. You tell me where she is and I won't kill you. I see. And if I say no? Oh, well, if you don't tell me, then I'll kill you. I suppose that makes things nice and simple, doesn't it? So, that's what you're getting at. You've been trying to make a fool of me this entire time, haven't you? Right now, with the way things are going, are you just so scared that you've completely snapped? You're getting on my nerves. Talk smack to me one more time, and I'm seriously going to kill you. Princess. Huh? It's Princess Selphine, you disrespectful brat. Ritona had been trying to play cool and collected, but there was a slight rage in her eyes. I don't know what you wish to accomplish by attacking the royal family, but to address the princess of a country that way shows a complete and utter lack of respect. Such brazen behavior shows that you lack in morals as well. W what? Enough talk. Have at you. You'll only steer us into conflict regardless, so let me teach you rules of my own. D didn't you hear a single word I said? What, you want to fight me at a time like this? Or what, just because you're a duel you think you can take anyone on? 
Are you an idiot? Do you have absolutely no common sense at all? A title like that doesn't mean squat outside of the Alliance. On guard! Whoa! No, no, that, is that... Glass? A glass sword? You really expect to fight me with one of those? So it is. What of it? You're nothing but a glass worker, an artisan crafter. You seriously think you can put up a fight with me? Enough, you little brat. You're nothing but talk. I swear, you call me a little brat again and again. Stop cleaning me like a kid or you're down to get what's coming to ya. Why isn't she attacking? Is she stalling for time? Hell if I know who you are, but I don't have the time to deal with the likes of some stupid artisan crafter. Clack clack. As Coco continued to scream at the top of her lung, she knocked the tip of her staff against the ground, causing a triangle just large enough for a human to appear beneath Rutona's feet. What? A range attack, so she's not a battle crafter? I'll kill you with a single hit. Die! Triangle incineration. Bless! In a split second, a column of fire roars out from the triangle towards the ceiling. Too slow. Uh. Ritona circles around Coco's rear and makes contact with Coco's back. Gah! The next moment, Coco dashes away with all her might, trying to put as much distance between her and Ritona. She quickly checks her back to assess the wound, but... Huh? It isn't cut. The sensation of her spine getting sliced in two slowly fades away. What just... Toto understood that very moment. Ritona's sword isn't some decoration or a fake weapon, but it is in fact a real weapon, a strange and highly dangerous one. Trans Transidian. That's what this sword is made out of. Tr Transidian? It is a material set to hold the sharpest edge in the entire world. Of course I know that, but the way Transidian breaks off is too uncontrollable. They say it's too dangerous, impossible to forge into weaponry. Only if it's naturally occurring. But I've already applied some level of process into the Transidian I create. I can freely control this material. Uh, are you stupid? If you can make something as complex as Transidian, then why don't you just stick to something tougher and easier like metal? <laughs> metal, glass. As long as it can cut through anything, then who cares? You're making even less sense now. How? Why is some artisan like you even fighting with a sword in the first place? You still haven't realized? A little slow on the uptake, I see. I'm a battle crafter. Rutona leaps off the ground. Sh she's getting close. Need to keep my distance. Sh Shadow soldiers! The shadow from the staff stretched, and the dark silhouettes of soldiers began to crawl out from the ground. Hmm? Three, four of them. Suddenly, Ratona was surrounded on all sides. What the shadow soldiers? She didn't summon them at will? So she's... She's the one who created the sajos, shadow soldiers who attacked the castle. Careful, everyone. That girl is really fast, and her sword is super sharp. And don't don't get anywhere near the commit area. Toto then raised her staff, generating what seemed to be waves of mana in the air. The mana glowing in the air then went straight to the Dark Soldier's hands. Pyro, Terra, Forge, Chains! She again knocks her staff against the ground twice, causing the glowing mana that had been floating in the air to materialize into chains. First, I'm gonna tie you down. Now. <laughs> now you're trapped. You and your stupid acrobatics. This is the end for you. Coco and the shadow, shadow soldiers had Ritona tied up in chains, surrounded, and then... Pentagram incineration. Coco using her staff and the soldiers using their jet black swords all slammed the ground at once. Small glowing points just appeared, 
with light racing across them to draw a large pentagram beneath Ritona's feet. Bless. Hmm. The pillar of light disperses. The triangular burn mark was on the ceiling. Beside it was a much larger star-shaped hole with the night sky and full moon in full view shining brightly. Ah <laughs> I burnt her into nothing but ashes. The shadow soldiers didn't budge a single inch, leaving her perplexed. Then she realized. Just so you know. Depending on how you handle Transidian, you can even cut through steel. Th the shadow soldiers are vanishing, which means that as long as you cut them down, then you can still defeat them. No way. Some kind of glass that lets you cut through steel? That's cheating. Something doesn't add up here. You, you're no battle crafter, are you? Your triangle and pentagram attacks certainly weren't lacking in power, especially the second one. Had I taken the brunt of the blast, I'd, let, I'd likely be nothing more than ash by now. But the activation, your bless, takes far too long. Anything that takes that long would be completely unusable for a battle, no matter how strong it is. Your st style of fighting at a distance why do you persist on such strange tactics? Oh, shut up. If it works, then who cares? Damn it. Her hand gripping on her staff begins to quiver, frustrated at the turn of events. Why is someone this strong just wandering in, wandering the castle? Well, in any case, I suppose you understand now that you have no chance of winning. I am not at all disposed to fighting. If at all possible, I'd prefer to settle conflicts with dialogue, but are you gonna listen? The feeling of the search slowly fades away. H huh? Koko was flabbergasted at Ritona's disappointment of a statement. Then, ah ha 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 There's something else, you know that? Koko realizes something. That she had the upper hand. That Ritona would ultimately not attack her. She sneers at Ritona's invitation. Mm. Coco uses all of her might, striking Ritona with her staff. We make a complete mess of your country, your hometown. Ah ha ha ha! And you want to talk? Are you a freaking moron? Indeed. This is not the time nor the place to exercise Rosenhide's pacifist views. Ritona understood that clearly. She could use. She could more than easily have taken Coco's head if she wanted to. Even after getting her back twice, not once did she attack. Ritona herself had resisted the urge to take her life. The overwhelming difference in their strength was absolutely meaningless in the face of Ritona's greatest weakness. You have nothing on me. When it comes to combat, I am clearly ahead and shoulders above you. And here you are, still struggling desperately against me. Who's the fool now? This is seriously pissing me off. You think you're so high and mighty? You're telling the person who killed your friends, your comrades, that you just want to talk? Hey, tell me. Is it so wrong to take a life if it means protecting someone you can't live without? What? Hey, answer me. What's the difference between me and you? For just a moment, Ritona was shaken for a moment by Coco's ruse and had lost concentration. She wasn't the type to make that kind of mistake. Not in the slightest. Unbelievable. Indeed. Even if Ritona had no intent on taking someone's life, she would never slip and let her attention waver from the battle. Someone must have been toying with her for that moment. Someone. Someone right behind her. Commit breaker. What? The sword in Ritona's hand scatters into tiny fragments. The commit. Did the ratio and mana change all of a sudden? When? Let me introduce you. This is my partner on the battlefield, Miss Mary Shell. Mary Shell strikes her yo pose once again. Coco, make new shadow soldiers? Yes, that's why I said, should dispel. New soldiers, balance is bad. I'm sorry. Why you, what did you just do? 
destroyed. Commit. Commit breaker. Don't be absurd. The moment Ratona understands the current situation, she shudders. Coco's craft are powerful, but takes a while to bless. And a partner who compensates for that. The perfect combination. She will get killed. Because she took too long. Because even when given the chance, she didn't kill Coco. My lady, please get down on the ground. Okay. Oh. That's a nice camouflage. On Ratona's signal, the glass wall in the edge of the room shatters. The glass which bent light and severed and served as optical camouflage. Selphine has been hiding the entire time and now she was exposed. H huh? Selphine? So fast. Well, what's with the mana here? Maybe this is shift? Huh? A shift? Selphine, please close your eyes for a moment. A vortex of wind envelops Ratona and Selphine. Coco, get out. Now, the next moment. What? Hey, just what? What? What the heck just. They vanished? Okay, I think that. How long has it been? 46 minutes. <laughs> I think that's the end of the first video. Um, for Seiya no Yuta, there's voice acting, and there's no voice acting in this one, and it's not a problem. I don't mind reading. It's just a lot harder because I have to read literally everything, and it's a lot harder to give my views because <clears throat> my voice is kind of sore. I didn't want the video to be this long. I'll probably do like aim for like 30 to 40 minute videos since it's a lot harder on my voice. Well, that's pretty cool. We got a, a sneak peek of, or not a sneak peek, basically the peaceful country of an alliance is being invaded. We saw some sort of magic skills. So I guess the, how I made the comparison to mana and in, in the origin stuff in Fate is a little different because in Fate the unique stuff was like super common while the elements were less common while in this one I guess the units are super uncommon while the elements are common relatively and you know we gotta look at some fire magic and artisan which is Terra? I think they said it was Terra in the beginning which is Earth but she's dual right? We don't know her second uh, color. Yeah, so we got an introduction to the characters of Coco, Mary Shell, who are on the opposing side of Ritona, and well, we didn't really get to see Selfie that much. But yeah, I hope you enjoy. My voice just hurts because I, I recorded a. Uh... That's my phone number. Perfect time to play it. Yeah, I recorded Say I Know Utah before this. So I literally just spoke for like two hours straight. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoy and come back. And I'll see you next time. Bye.